Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to the second, <clears throat> pardon me, of our series of African swine fever uh, awareness sessions. Today's session is titled, uh, Are You Ready to Detect and Respond to African Swine Fever? Uh, and today we will focus on disease response. Um, my name is Dr. Egan Brockoff. I am a practicing swine veterinarian with Prairie Swine Health Services in Red Deer, Alberta, uh, where we work with uh, swine clients in Canada, the United States, and five uh, countries in Asia, including China, where certainly African swine fever has been extremely devastating. Uh, since 2008, I have taught uh, swine medicine at the University of Calgary Faculty of Vet Medicine, and I am currently the veterinary counselor for the Canadian Pork Council. So welcome to our session. A few housekeeping notes today. Uh, this is a 60 minute lecture and following that lecture, there will be time for question and answer. So I would ask everyone to put their questions into the chat function. Um, and you can do that throughout the presentation. And then as we get to the end of the presentation, um, we'll start going through those questions. And so feel free to put questions in throughout the, the lecture as they come to mind. And uh, we'll try to capture as many of those as possible uh, at the end of our session today. Our presenter today is Dr. Bobby Lundquist. She's the National Operations Veterinary Specialist with the CFIA. Dr. Lundquist is a veterinarian in the National Operational Guidance and Expertise Terrestrial Animal Health Disease Control Unit with the Canadian, <clears throat> pardon me, Food Inspection Agency. She lives in Saskatchewan and Dr. Lundquist lives just outside of Saskatoon with her husband and her four girls. She received her DVM from the Western College of Veterinary Medicine and completed a master degree in large animal clinical sciences, specializing in veterinary epidemiology in 2015, also from WCBM. During her time with the CFIA, she's been the foreign animal disease preparedness veterinarian for the Saskatchewan region and Western Canada as well. Over the years, she has been engaged in federally reportable disease outbreaks such as anthrax, chronic wasting disease, avian influenza, and bovine tuberculosis, and engaged in the planning and implementation of foreign animal disease exercises, including exercises with USDA APHIS on foot and mouth disease. Um, currently, Dr. Lundquist is dedicated to um, African swine fever preparedness and prevention activities. And uh, we're extremely excited to have her here today uh, as she's been so heavily involved with this. So um, good afternoon and welcome Dr. Lundquist. Great, thanks Egan. And thanks to everybody for joining us today for this second part series uh, or within the three part series of African swine fever. So with that, I'm going to turn off my video just to increase my uh, internet stability and hopefully you can hear me still okay. okay. Okay, so in last week's presentation, Dr. Amy Snow reviewed the importance of ASF from a Canadian context. She reviewed the clinical recognition of ASF and finally, the roles of veterinarians in ASF detection. It set an important foundation for today's topic on ASF disease response. Today, we'll take some time to walk through the actions taken in responding to ASF from suspicion to confirmation and the roles of veterinarians in ASF disease response. So the content presented is really intended to be an awareness session. It should be noted that for each of the topics that we'll cover throughout this presentation, it originates from either policy referred to as the African Swine Fever Hazard Specific Plan or CFIA Functional Plans or CFIA Operational Guidance or materials developed in collaboration with stakeholders. Some of these materials are still under development and I'll point these areas out as we cover them. Most of the items we cover today can in fact be a presentation on its own. 
So that said, the goal is really to provide you with an overall big picture view of the ASF response measures. So an important first element to cover is why is the CFIA engaged in response to ASF? Well, the CFIA is Canada's official veterinary authority, and for any disease controlled by us, the Federal Health of Animals Act and regulations has a broad range of authorities that allows for response to federally reportable disease. Some examples of the regulatory authorities include the ability of a CFIA inspector or veterinarian to investigate the suspicion of an animal disease and ability to enter a property, to impose movement restrictions, to order destruction and disposal of animals and things, to pay compensation where a disposal order has been issued, and to order the C&D of the property, equipment and structures contaminated. These actions are consistent with international guidelines and standards set by the OIE for controlling animal disease outbreaks. Without this legislation, it would be the responsibility of provincial or territorial governments or industry to address incursions of serious animal diseases. So what happens if ASF is suspected? Well, when a suspicion of ASF is reported to the CFIA, the local CFIA district office will mobilize a team of staff to the farm of origin of the suspect animals to perform a field epidemiology investigation, establish biosecurity zones and implement biosecurity measures. They'll conduct diagnostic sampling and apply movement restrictions depending on the investigation findings. Each CFIA district office is equipped with an FAD response kit. It includes the equipment needed for sampling, supplies for personal protective equipment, and paperwork for the field epidemiology investigation and movement restrictions. The goal of the team that's visiting the premises is to determine the likelihood of ASF being present and to mitigate further spread of disease until the investigation is complete. Just a comment here about the photos that you see on the slide. These were taken from exercises and do not necessarily represent the number of staff performing each task. We really expect that each district office has a prepared contingency plan with identified staff that will assist in a suspect investigation. So one of the first actions to occur is the field epidemiology investigation. This starts as soon as the notification of a suspect is received and continues on farm to collect information on the premises itself, the herd of origin of the suspect animals, the animals affected, including their clinical history and production parameters, the owner or operator, the operation type, and if it is deemed that there's a risk of disease on the premise, the investigator collects further information on the potential sources of introduction or spread of disease. An established questionnaire called the Premises Investigation Questionnaire, or PIQ, as shown in the photo here, guides the investigators with a standard suite of questions. It should be noted that all the information that is collected by the CFIA is considered to be personal information and will be protected under the provisions of the Privacy Act. It's beneficial for producers to have information prepared in advance to support the EPI investigation. Some examples of those records that can be prepared include production records such as feed intake or mortality records, movement records including visitor logs in a 30-day period prior to the first detection of clinical signs, and a site plan of the premises that details all areas associated with animal production. These records will be requested at the time of the interview and the site plan will be detailed by the CFIA staff conducting the EPI investigation. In a suspect investigation, biosecurity measures will be implemented on the property to adhere to the principles of bio-exclusion, that is preventing the introduction of any disease agents onto the premise, biocontainment, which is ensuring no disease agents leave the premise, and finally, biomanagement, preventing the spread of disease agents within the property. In order to achieve all these elements, the CFIA response team will establish a series of biocontainment zones on the premise, including a cold, warm, and hot zone, as shown in the diagram on the left-hand side. 
Any CFIA responders entering into the warm and hot zones are required to follow strict biosecurity procedures called containment biosecurity. This requires the donning of appropriate personal protective equipment or PPE while ensuring biosecurity protocol is followed. As staff leave each zone, they doss the PPE at the boundary of each zone and follow a disinfection procedure as they exit to prevent any potential transfer of virus out of the respective zones. The photo on the right-hand side of the screen is really an example of the type of PPE that they will doff, or don and doff, and how equipment is transported in containers that can be easily disinfected coming out of each of the zones. So also part of the suspect investigation is an on-farm clinical examination and diagnostic sampling conducted by CFIA. The diagnostic team must perform a clinical examination of the affected animals and consult with the EPI team to determine if there is a risk of ASF on the premise. If AF ASF is suspected, it is deemed as a high risk. In this situation, it means that there's a clinical presentation consistent with ASF and possible other indicators or findings that suggest it may have been introduced into the property. A low risk determination is made when ASF cannot be ruled out. Here, the presentation has some clinical signs consistent with ASF, but domestic diseases that present similar to it have not been ruled out. For both the high and low risk determinations, samples will be collected and movement restrictions will be placed. Finally, if there's no evidence of ASF found in the EPI investigation and clinical, clinical examination, it's classified as a negligible risk. This decision is usually made in consultation with specialists and will mean that no samples or further movement restrictions uh, be placed on the premise. The types of samples that are collected for ASF include collecting blood on nine animals demonstrating clinical signs, and conducting a postmortem examination and collecting tissues from up to five animals, including tonsil, spleen, defined lymph nodes, kidney, lung, liver, brain, ileocecal valve, and spinal cord. Bodily fluids may also be collected as well as bone marrow, which becomes a target tissue for decomposed carcasses. All samples are sent to the CFIA's National Center for Foreign Animal Disease, NCFAD, located in Winnipeg, Manitoba. So the other critical component of the initial investigation is the application of movement restrictions. When the CFIA response team arrives on the farm, one of the first movement restriction actions that should occur if it's not already done by the producer is the establishment of restricted entry to the premise. This ensures that there's no unnecessary movements allowed into the property while the investigation is underway and that all, all essential vehicle entries are restricted to one single entry point. Other movement restrictions that are applied are really related to the risk determination that's made during the suspect investigation. So if you recall, in the case of a negligible risk determination, no restrictions will be placed. If there is a low risk determination made, a quarantine is applied to the sampled animals, their cohorts, and any carcasses until test results are available. In this situation, the producer is recommended to maintain restricted access to the property and barns until test results are known. And finally, if ASF is suspected and a high risk determination is made, a quarantine of all animals on the premise, a declaration of infected place is issued to restrict all movements into, out of, and within the premise. There is maintenance of this movement restriction until the lab results are received. So at the conclusion of the investigation, the CFIA response team will return to the district office to prepare and ship samples to NCFAD. If ASF is suspected, further notification will occur within CFIA to ensure a state of readiness is initiated should it be confirmed. So in the case where there's a strong suspicion of the presence of ASF, for example, the trigger to investigate is due to a non-negative ASF test result from a suspect animal tested by a provincial lab, or initial testing is done by NCFAD and is positive for ASF but is pending confirmation, it might be or may be considered as a presumptive case. 
In this situation, CFIA will initiate some immediate actions before the disease is confirmed by NCFAD. These include any further diagnostic sampling that's required. In particular, this might be warranted or requested by NCFAD in situations where the full set of samples were not originally submitted. The EPI investigation will also continue at this point as a means of contact tracing to identify all animals and premises where disease may have spread to or been introduced from. These premises are referred to as epidemiologically linked premises. Once these are identified, movement restrictions are placed on those premises that are at higher risk of exposure because they provided to or received animals from the premise within a, the defined tracing period, or they are located within three kilometers of the presumptive case premise, or they've had some other significant contact to allow exposure to the disease. Also at this time, CFIA will confirm that there are appropriate movement restrictions and biosecurity protocols on the presumptive case premise. And finally, the CFIA will immediately communicate with stakeholders such as the pork industry and provinces or territories to possibly recommend a voluntary standstill of all swine movements for 72 hours. Just a note about this voluntary standstill, that it's a currently the topic of discussion of an established stakeholder working group the intent of the standstill is to address the situation of the first detection of ASF in Canada to have early measures to stop the spread of disease within the swine population before CFIA has all controls in place. So the takeaway message with the actions for the presumptive case really are, because the time to confirmation of ASF may take several days or longer, all measures implemented at this stage are aimed at stopping any further spread of disease. So we've reviewed the regulatory actions in a suspect investigation and presumptive case. Now let's move on to what happens if ASF is confirmed in Canada. Once it's confirmed by our national lab, it is at this point that Canada will internationally report a case of ASF. With this disease, because of the severe impact on the Canadian pork producers supporting industries and economy, the disease response strategy is eradication. This means that all disease response actions are aimed to eliminate the disease from the domestic swine population with the goal of returning Canada to an ASF disease-free status as quickly as possible. It should be noted that if ASF is found in Canada's wild pig population, eradication is also the goal. But in this population, the disease response actions rely heavily on additional collaboration with provincial or territorial authorities. It should also be understood that even in the situation where ASF is enzootic in wild pigs, as per the OIE, Canada can still claim disease freedom in the domestic population only, but we would need to be able to demonstrate a clear separation between the domestic and wild populations. This will rely on confidence and biosecurity of all farms with pigs, regardless of the operation size. So how does CFIA actually manage a large scale incident? Well, following the 2004 outbreak of highly pathogenic avian influenza in British Columbia, the CFA adopted the use of Incident Command System, or ICS, to be able to manage the response activities. ICS was developed by California firefighters for emergency response and is used by many emergency response organizations. The advantage of using ICS is it provides a modular organizational structure approach to disease response that can be expanded or collapsed to meet the needs of the incident. It allows an accountable approach to the actions required and ensures that there's a manageable span of control. So that is that no single person or function has more than seven direct reports. Other advantages that ICS offers include, it establishes a centralized location for managing the incident. It uses a deployment approach of responders who are trained or have experience in the response activities. And it has immediate engagement with stakeholders. Many provinces and some industry associations have also adopted ICS as their incident management system for animal disease outbreaks. 
So on the screen here is an example of the ICS structure and main functions that could be implemented to support the disease response. There are five major management activities, which are the foundation on which the ICS organization develops. The first of which is command, here shown in green at the top, is the incident commander. They're ultimately responsible for all event activities, and in red just below them is the command staff functions that report to the incident commander. Although other functions may be left unfulfilled, within ICS, there is always an incident commander. So there's always somebody accountable. Next of the five major management activities is the operations section that you can see on the far left in orange. They're responsible for implementing disease response field actions, and they're really what we consider to be the boots on the ground portion of the response. The planning section in blue oversees all incident related data gathering and analysis. They maintain the status of and assign resources and prepare the incident action plan along with all incident related documentation. Logistics in yellow is responsible for ordering resources, providing facilities, transportation, responders, supplies, food, medical services, and orientation of all incoming responders. And finally, in gray is the finance and administration. They track all costs associated with the incident, all personnel and equipment records, and any procurement contracts associated. Partner agencies, including provincial or territorial governments and other federal agencies, and industry representation is embedded into the ICS structure as defined by their specific preparedness plans with CFIA. These agencies and associations may also activate their own ICS structure at the same time as CFIA to deal with the disease response elements that they will require engagement with. So just as an aside as to why do we place so much importance on and plan to use ICS? Well, in the past with some of the larger disease responses that CFIA has responded to, at times we have had several hundred responders deployed during peak response activities. We anticipate an occurrence of ASF in Canada has the potential to require as many or more responders and resources depending on the scope of the outbreak. But by using ICS, it allows an organized structure to manage a complex situation. So we've described how to manage the incident, but how do we respond to the disease? Well, there's some key, key items that will happen. Within a few hours of confirmation, the process is set into motion to respond to the disease. The basic principles used in eradicating ASF R2 First, eliminate the sources of disease agent. Second, prevent further transmission between infected and infected animals and susceptible animals. And third, contain the disease agent to a geographic area. Once disease is confirmed, the following steps are immediately put into motion on the infected premise. This includes the epi investigation, depopulation of all swine on the premise, and disposal of all carcasses and ASF contaminated things. Later activities include cleaning and disinfection and subsequent restocking with animals. Actions beyond the infected premise will be applied to any epidemiologically linked premise. So as you recall, this includes any premises that may be a potential source of ASF or where ASF may have spread to. We will also identify and take actions at this point on any farm with swine located three kilometers up to a minimum of 10 kilometers away from the infected premise. And we refer to these as monitored premises. The disease response actions applied to epi-linked and monitored premises include conducting a field epi investigation, clinical examination and diagnostics testing, and finally issuance of movement restrictions. These premises will also be subject to zoning and outbreak surveillance requirements. So as you can see by the green colored check marks, many of these actions start immediately and simultaneously, which only emphasizes why having a response plan and use of ICS is so important to be able to generate the resources to, to conduct them. So let's now take a closer look at these response actions, starting with the EPI investigation. The goal of the EPI investigation is to be able to describe the outbreak in real time. 
limit the size of the outbreak through rapid identification of any potential sources of or spread of disease by investigating all modes of transmission and to inform disease response actions based on these findings. In order to meet these goals, first, there must be further investigation of each infected premise to describe the basics of the five W's of who, what, where, when, and why, or how. So this includes describing the premises and animals affected, when and how ASF was introduced, the occurrence of disease on each premise, and when and where the agent may have spread from the farm. As we have talked about already, the other major component of the EPI investigation is to identify all EPI-linked premises for further investigation and diagnostic sampling. Each will have a risk determination made as per the extent of exposure to infected animals or infected premises, and they will be prioritized for which ones should be investigated first. A key output of the EPI actions is to have rapid identification and investigation of all sources of all sources and spread of disease, and to have timely, accurate, and complete information on the disease outbreak to inform disease response activities. When we look at the surveillance and diagnostics that should occur during a response, sampling and clinical examination is conducted on all epi-length premise, all monitored premises, any suspect premise, when pre-movement testing requires sampling, and for any property identified as part of the outbreak surveillance requirements. The intent of outbreak surveillance is multi-purpose. By this we mean it's conducted to determine the extent of disease spread, to detect any new cases, to ensure there's no movement of diseased animals, and to provide evidence that animals outside of the disease control zones are not infected with ASF. Some other components of the outbreak surveillance actions will include wild pig surveillance to determine disease presence or absence of it in this population, and may include tick surveillance if ticks are suspected to be involved in disease transmission. As mentioned already, CFIA's NCFAD in Winnipeg is the official confirmatory lab for ASF and will conduct diagnostic testing during the outbreak but it's also anticipated that provincial laboratories approved for ASF testing will be engaged in outbreak surveillance diagnostic testing. So let's move on now to a big element of the disease response, which is movement control. In general, there are two main ways to apply movement controls. By applying restrictions to individual premises, or by declaring a primary control zone, otherwise referred to as a PCZ. The PCZ is a legally defined control zone declared by the minister or the CFIA president. We need both of these methods to control or otherwise referred to as zoning because even though the CFIA aims to declare a PCZ as soon as possible, it does not happen immediately on confirmation. So until a PCZ is declared, individual premises movement controls will be applied to all infected, epi-linked, and monitored premises. The individual controls are implemented by way of a declaration of infected place and or quarantine issuance. In general, these controls prevent each, pre each premises from moving animals or things until such time that the extent of the outbreak can be determined for the establishment of a primary control zone. Once a PCZ is declared, the movement restrictions are more of a blanket approach to all designated animals and things, which includes all premises with swine and things which may transmit ASF, including examples such as swine products, byproducts, manure, equipment, or feed. Here, all movements in, out, through, and within the PCZ are restricted by specific conditions that must be met and permitted by the CV CFIA before movement can occur. We'll now go into a little more detail on the use of a primary control zone. While the general objective of implementing movement restrictions is to geographically control the spread of disease, you may be wondering why do we need to differentiate between applying controls on individual premises versus the blanket approach with a PCZ? 
Well, the reason is that the declaration of a PCZ is anticipated to be the most acceptable type of zoning for international recognition during an outbreak. So that is with some international trading partners, they may recognize the zone boundaries established with the PCZ and allow trade to resume from free areas of the country. Canada has been working with pre-existing zoning arrangements in place to facilitate this recognition. Currently, this includes the EU and US. The trading partner really ultimately um, has the authority over the conditions required to resume trade. So as you can see in the diagram, the primary control zone is really the overarching zone. Everything outside of the PCZ is generally referred to as the free zone, which is where trade would be allowed if the foreign countries recognize our zoning. At the minimum, the PCZ will include an infected zone as indicated in pink and includes a distance up to a minimum of three kilometers from an infected premise. The PCZ will also at minimum uh, include a restricted zone as indicated in orange, which is the area three kilometer up to a minimum of 10 kilometers from the infected premise. You can see on the diagram, there's an additional zone called the security zone in yellow. This zone is optional and may not be implemented, especially if the disease is restricted to a low number of premises. If a, if a security zone is used, this is mostly for the purposes of surveillance and to act as a buffer zone. If a security zone is not used, a surveillance area is required, but is considered to be outside of the PCZ and is established to help conduct surveillance activities. So I'd just like to take a moment here to emphasize the key takeaway points. First, zoning is a disease control tool. The controls implemented and the requirement for CFIA approved movements mitigates the risk of disease spread by animals or things. And second, by implementing zoning, it defines a disease-free area where trade can be resumed should trading partners recognize Canada's zoning. So this slide demonstrates a few examples of how a PCZ would look depending on the outbreak. On the left-hand side of the screen, the outbreak demonstrated is a single infected premise with an infected and restricted zone. In this scenario, the outer boundary of the PCZ is 10 kilometers from the infected premise. On the right-hand side, the outbreak consists of several infected premises within a geographic region. In this situation, there are multiple infected zones defined with coalescing restricted zones. So here, the PCZ boundary is the outermost edge of all of the restricted zones. Depending on the outbreak, it's possible that we could have multiple PCZs in geographically distinct areas separated by a free zone. It should be noted here that the intent is for the PCZ to be as small as possible while achieving geographic containment of disease. But we recognize the size will vary depending on the scope of the outbreak. So let's move on to depopulation, a key eradication action that must be used in ASF response. Here, all swine on an infected premise, regardless of individual animal infection status, will be ordered disposed of by the CFIA. A few things to note here include the fact that on an infected premise, depopulation is specific to pigs only and will not include non-susceptible animals. Also, the CFIA will only order the disposal of pigs on infected farms. We will not extend this to any welfare depopulation calls that may be required. The destruction methods used depend on the swine production type, size of animals to be destroyed, number of animals, and the facilities they are housed in. Also, the method used must account for the need to remove and dispose of the carcasses so the location where destruction occurs has to be easily accessed. The destruction method must also consider provincial and international animal welfare requirements and be in compliance with uh, biocontainment measures. For each premises which animals must be depopulated, a destruction plan must be determined. It may employ the use of one or more destruction techniques, particularly for situations where there are different ages and sizes of animals. As part of ASF preparedness activities, over the past several months, various destruction methods 
that may be considered in Canada have been compiled by a stakeholder working group. The reason for this collaboration is that no single entity, CFIA province or industry has the resources to complete this task on their own. The options for killing animals are limited and some of the biggest challenges lie with the logistics of carrying out the available killing methods. At the end of the day, regardless of the method used, destruction is a key tool in our response strategy in order to stop the transmission from infected to susceptible animals. Destruction of all swine on, on infected premises serves to the purpose of disrupting viral replication, therefore reducing the viral shedding and environmental contamination as quickly as possible. Once depopulation is completed, the disposal of carcasses and all things that may be contaminated with ASF must be disposed of in a manner to prevent the further transmission of disease. For every infected premise, it must be decided on the most appropriate disposal option and where possible on-site disposal is preferred over off-site. So you can see here, we've listed some options for disposal. These include options such as burial, with this option as, so, as shown in the top photo, it must take into consideration any of the environmental factors or municipal or provincial requirements. Landfills may also be an option, but require an approved landfill willing to accept the carcasses and materials and transportation to the landfill is required. Incineration as shown in the bottom photo is an option, but again must take into account any environmental restrictions by municipal or provincial regulations. Additionally, the optics of open burning is usually publicly unfavorable and the addition of flammable content is required in open burning to get a proper burn. Rendering is also an option. With this option, it requires transportation and may have capacity limitations. In order to use this method, the materials must be accepted by rendering facilities that are willing to take them and perform all necessary biosecurity requirements. And the last option here is composting. This option is only available when carcasses are reduced. It also requires knowledgeable staff and equipment and continuous monitoring of the compost to ensure appropriate time temperature requirements are sufficient to inactivate the ASF virus. For each disposal method, it poses logistical challenges and is subject to provincial regulation. Finally, each option must ensure that appropriate biosecurity measures are applied to minimize environmental contamination and the long-term impacts of the chosen method must be determined in collaboration with the respective authority responsible. The key point here with disposal is that because it is an eradication measure, whatever method is used must meet the goal of either inactivating the disease agent or preventing further disease transmission. So it needs to be noted here that for all animals or things ordered destroyed by the CFIA, the owner will be eligible for compensation for the market value of the animals at the time of the order to dispose and for any disposal costs incurred as part of the disposal method used. The CFIA does not compensate for lost production or the final value of the animal but in order to ensure a fair market value is determined for the animals ordered destroyed, a formal evaluation is completed and takes into consideration any factors that can support the value of the animal, such as sales records and genetic value. It should be noted that discussions are also underway to ensure the market value used for evaluation remains constant from the time the outbreak starts. This is because market values typically drop as soon as disease is detected. With CFIA compensation, a maximum value for swine is predetermined by the compensation for destroyed animal regulations. This means that sometimes, despite the value of the animal, we have a ceiling on how much can be compensated. In some cases, additional financial support may be available through other government support funds. So next, we'll move on to cleaning and disinfection procedures that are applied at each infected premise. Once the disposal of all carcasses and things ordered destroyed is complete, the next eradication action to take place is the cleaning and decontamination of all remaining structures, equipment, and things on the infected premise. 
Generally, the CND actions include the removal of all organic mater material, washing or other suitable cleaning methods, and application of a disinfectant approved for the use for ASF. The CND must be completed before individual premises movement restrictions can be lifted and before Canada can start the process of surveillance to demonstrate country freedom and OIE standards. This, this slide is a visual representation of how cleaning and disinfection is a multi-step process. The first step involves an assessment of the premise or facility and developing a written plan for how the process will be carried out. This is followed by a dry cleaning step to remove all organic matter, then a wet cleaning phase and rinse, followed by a dry period and application of disinfectant approved for use in ASF. Just a note here that this disinfectant application is currently required to be repeated twice due to the resistant nature of the virus. And finally, there's a dry period and final inspection. The actual CND process is not performed by the CFIA, but is the responsibility of the owner or operator. An inspection by CFIA is required for the initial assessment at the completion of the wet cleaning phase and after each of the disinfectant applications to ensure the procedure was completed according to the CND plan. The length of time it takes to complete the CND process does vary, but once it's complete, a fallow period or vacancy period must be followed. The length of time of the vacancy period depends on the use of sentinel animals or not, and it should be noted that this portion of the policy is still under development. So at the completion of the vacancy period and sentinel animal monitoring if used, the release of individual premises may occur. The key message with the CND measures is that once they're complete, there should be no viable disease agent remaining on the premise to cause subsequent ASF transmission. So this slide is really a means to show in a single diagram all of the elements we've covered from suspicion to disease confirmation. Once we have completed all of the disease eradication activities and move into the recovery period as shown on the far right, there will continue to be actions conducted such as post outbreak surveillance, where here the goal is to provide evidence that Canada is free of ASF. And a final epidemiology report is completed to describe the outbreak and identify the sources, the potential sources of introduction. Of course, the time it takes for a response to be completed depends on factors such as the scope of the outbreak, the time it takes to perform surveillance, and if there's an establish of ASF in the wild pig population, or if ticks are found to be involved in transmission, the timeline will be extended. Question you might have is, will our response always look like this? Well, the answer is usually yes, but there are some situations where variations to the response will occur. So one example is a case where ASF is detected in wild pigs. Here, the incident requires close engagement with provincial and territorial authorities to support the eradication measures, but also the zoning boundaries may vary to more accurately match the natural range of the wild pig population to achieve the geographic containment of disease. These discussions about the wild pig disease strategy are ongoing. Another situation to consider is that discussions are underway regarding an ASF compartmentalization program, where in peacetime, herds that enroll and are compliant with compartment standards may be allowed continuation or early resumption of trade and possibly international movement, depending on acceptance by trading partners. I should note here though, if there is a detection of ASF in a herd enrolled in the compartment, it would lead to immediate suspension and all response activities that we've covered here today would be applied. Regardless of these variations, at the end of the day, the goal is always to move to the recovery phase as quickly as possible to eliminate the disease and for Canada to declare freedom from ASF. So now we've, that we've covered the ASF response, a question to consider is what, might a, what role might a veterinarian play during the disease response stage? Well, the role of veterinarians is multifold. First, veterinarians have a critical role in the communication that they will have with at-risk or affected clients. 
You become key partners in stressing the importance of on-farm biosecurity practices, educating clients on when to suspect disease and how to mitigate their risk of disease introduction. Also during an outbreak, we continue to rely on the BEC community to be the eyes on the ground for, de for detection and reporting of any new suspect cases. And finally, we also see a role for veterinarians to become directly engaged in the response activities, either under contract with CFIA as part of stakeholder engagement or through service provision. CFIA will contract or hire veterinarians to support actions such as epi investigation, outbreak surveillance activities, or destruction activities as a few examples. Connection to veterinarians will be really important during an outbreak, and we expect that that community will be engaged from the outset by a few different means. At the national level, the CVMA and other national veterinary groups will be included in regular update calls and receive information from the Chief Veterinary Officer for Canada. At the provincial or territorial level, the respective Veterinary Medical Association will be a source of information for veterinarians. And locally, veterinarians may receive information from their local CFIA di district office. The communication element from veterinarians and all stakeholders during an ASF outbreak is critical to ensure that there's awareness about the disease and when to suspect it, how to prevent and protect against the spread of ASF, and to ensure there's a continued consumer confidence in the food safety of Canadian pork. The CFIA will provide communications on the status of the outbreak, risk factors involved, contact information, and disease information through our general website, which can be found at www.inspection.gc.ca. We expect for awareness sessions and media communications coming from all stakeholders to provide similar messaging as you see here on the slide. So just to wrap up today's session, together we've walked through the actions that will be taken when ASF is suspected, when there's a presumptive case, and once ASF is confirmed. We've also reviewed the role of private veterinarians should an outbreak occur and the communication elements of a response. While we ultimately have the goal of keeping Canada ASF free, we must be prepared should we need to respond. CFIA continues to work with stakeholders to improve on Canada's state of readiness to respond. So this concludes the part two portion of the ASF webinar series. In next week's presentation of part three, Dr. Amy Snow will cover ASF prevention and preparedness and expand on the role of veterinarians. Finally, I'd like to take the time to thank you for participating in today's session. And now I'll pass it back to Dr. Brockoff for any questions that may have come in during this uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, presentation, Dr. Lundquist. That was fantastic. We have a number of questions that have come in through the chat function. I would just remind everyone if you have specific questions, um, we have uh, a good 12 minutes to review questions before the end of the hour. So first question for you. Um, could you review the involvement of the CVMA Veterinary Reserve in the face of a foreign animal disease? So the CVR is, um, does have membership of many different veterinarians throughout Canada. Um, there is a potential role for CVR in an outbreak of ASF. There's still discussions going on regarding um, the activation and kind of tapping into the CBR for a response, but we do expect that they would be part of the resources that we could look at in the, in a time of need. Um, I think, Amy, is there anything, I guess maybe I'll look to Amy Snow to see if there's anything else that you would uh, suggest here for the CBR. Yeah, sure, Bobby. Can you hear me all right? Yeah. I can hear you great. Okay, perfect. So, I mean, I, I think we have to think beyond the CBR as well. I know that the CVMA, or excuse me, the CFIA is undertaking sort of a review of our response protocols to determine where um, any sort of um, outside parties would have opportunities for participating in a CFIA response under the oversight of the CVMA. Or why do I keep saying that? Under the oversight of the CFIA, excuse me. Um, so we definitely foresee roles for um, veterinary professionals and others that are outside the CFIA. 
And um, I think maybe Bobby, you mentioned this, but some of these functions may require parties to be under contract with the CFIA. Other ones, it might be a little less formal than that, but just because of our legislation, there are certain limitations to what um, non-CFIA people can um, actually perform unless they're under a more formal arrangement with the agency. <clears throat> great, thanks, Amy. Yeah, great, thank you for that. So our next question is, a, is um, uh, involving packers, so slaughter plant facilities that are located within the restricted or security zone. How will those slaughter plants be managed if they are within that primary control zone? Yeah, so this, I guess it does depend where they exactly sit um, in the response. So once we're in a primary control zone, and I guess at the end of the day, there's still active discussions going on in regards to the role of slaughter establishments within the PCZ and what kind of uh, roles they'll play or restrictions that will be placed on them. I think at this point, maybe I'll look to you, Amy, to see if there's anything else that you would like to comment on on this question. Yeah, so I think if a um, packer facility is actively implicated um, in managing infected swine, there would be a procedure that would need to be applied um, for cleaning and disinfection. Um, so that's one thing to consider. Um, obviously, um, our goal is to have um, abattoirs available for use, um, primarily within a zone, perhaps for um, welfare call purposes. Um, but if there's a disease risk there, we have to eliminate that first. Um, it would be unlikely, I would imagine, that we would utilize packer facilities to um, destroy infected animals, just given the fact, as Bobby mentioned, our preference would be to utilize on-site destruction methods for swine. And obviously not all um, categories of swine would lend themselves well to being um, processed through a, a packer facility. Um, so that's why the excess hog supply um, the use of packers to manage that excess supply is kind of what is being discussed um, at different tables. So obviously the CFIA is focused on the disease response. All of those welfare related issues that are um, a result of a disease investigation and response are managed um, by different individuals. So Agriculture Canada is heavily involved in those discussions as well as the provinces and industry. Um, I think in terms of um, plants that are outside the security uh, zone or the PCZ, um, excuse me, obviously we want to maximize the potential use of those facilities for continuing to process hogs that may ultimately be destined for export. Um, however, there may be some plants that are outside of the uh, primary control zone that may be particularly earmarked to slaughter animals that are um, originating from inside the zone that have been um, that have met our permitting requirements um, to move out of the zone for slaughter, um, but those plants would be for domestic use only. So there's a variety of different options on how plants could be used. And as Bobby mentioned, um, those discussions are ongoing and it's really important for industry to be at the table because there will have to be some concessions made and decisions made in terms of how the different plants are utilized for what purpose. Great, thank you very much, Amy, for that. Um, Great to see so many questions coming in. We'll work towards getting through as many of them as we can. Our next question came earlier on in the presentation and it asks, um, swine barns have a requirement that all personnel going into the barn should use clothing provided by the company. How does that align with recommendations for use of Tyvek suits inside the barn in case of an investigation? Yeah, this is a question that has come up um, in the past in our preparedness activities. And what we expect with CFIA is that when they don their PPE, they use the biocontainment zones that they've established for that property. And they may implement some of the natural boundaries that the farm already has in place. And it's certainly recommended where possible to do that. But we won't necessarily use the dedicated uh, clothing that is there on site. We will use what we have in our FAD go kits. Um, but it's with the understanding that we try as much as possible to respect the biosecurity procedures 
on that property with the exception of that uh, PPE requirement that we have for our staff going in. Okay, great. Yeah, and that's something that we see quite commonly in the sector is, is uh, people using dedicated um, Tyvex or disposable coveralls and moving those in with a biosecure protocol. So um, fairly common within the sector. Bunch more questions I'll try to get through. Um, a good question here on hunting of wild pigs. And it was, we'll see if I have access to dogs bred to hunt wild pigs. And I think that question speaks to the greater um, question around how does hunting impact wild pigs? And so perhaps Bobby, um, maybe we could speak to that and to the greater issue about how hunting um, can be utilized in a positive and or how hunting can be um, negative in wild pig control. So Bobby. Yeah, so this, oh yeah, please go ahead, Amy, if you'd like. Okay. Um, so in terms of hunting and wild pigs, I think we have to use caution when we're considering how we use that specific tool as Egan um, alluded to. So in some circumstances, um, hunting of wild pigs can actually make the wild pig situation worse because you're kind of applying a pressure to that population which tends to cause them to um, scatter and divide their sounder groups. And then that seems to somehow trigger reproductive activity. Um, so we can actually sometimes make a, a management or control situation significantly worse by hunting. Um, I think in the European Union, in terms of their response to um, African swine fever and wild pigs in, um, the areas that surround the infected zone specifically, they may use very controlled hunting methods to um, reduce population because obviously if you have a less dense wild pig population, you have less likely transmission within that population. So that is an objective. Um, but again, that would be a very controlled situation with um, professional hunters that have been trained in um, various elements of ASF management. Um, one of the things that we have also learned from the European Union was that they actually have dogs specifically trained to identify wild pig carcasses, which is a very important part of a disease response involving wild pigs. So those, these pig, or dogs are specially trained to identify the carcasses but not contact the carcasses to avoid the potential for indirect transmission. So that's something else that as a collective we'll have to consider moving forward as we're um, considering how Canada would respond to a wild pig incursion of African swine fever. So Bobby or Egan, anything you'd like to add to that? I, I guess on this front, like we did point out that there are discussions underway on this. So some of this will get fleshed out over time um, and it will be a collaborative approach between CFIA and, and provincial and territorial authorities. Great, thank you for that. Um, trying to get through a few more questions. Um, there was a question here on compensation. To clarify, and here's the question to clarify, I think I heard that compensation to producers would be capped. Is this correct? And if so, what criteria are used to cap the compensation? Yeah, so, so we do have under our compensation regulations a ceiling on the values that can be applied for swine. It's, it's, it's it could be generous in some cases considering. Um, in other cases, when you have like high genetic value, it may not be actually matching the value of that animal. But when CFI goes out to do an evaluation of those animals, they really try to take as much resources as possible to gather the appropriate value of that animal at that time. And so, like I said, there was the one comment about that, you know, we're trying to make sure that market value that is um, at the time that the outbreak is detected remains a constant because there is that drop. Um, we do look at that and oftentimes we'll look at engaging with um, industry experts or kind of having like a, a validated approach to making sure it's a fair value that's given at the end of the day. Yeah, well, maybe great. I'll just Thanks. add to that quickly, Egan, as well, that um, there is situation in the US, for example, where they pay indemnity for um, animals ordered destroyed, and there are maximum so, sort of total values that can be utilized. So if 
there's a large disease event and that fund gets depleted, um, there is no more indemnity available, but that equivalent situation um, does not exist in Canada. Great, thank you for that, um, both of you. A couple more questions here. A question on C and D and requirements for manure. What C and D options or requirements would be uh, would there be for manure um, from an infected premise? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and it's one that's currently undergoing some further discussion right now, because um, we have scenarios where you could have large amounts of slurry um, that either needs to be treated or disposed of. So we're trying to look at some criteria to apply there that would not delay that premise from kind of that return or the release of movement restrictions, but also make sure that we have inactivated any virus in that slurry before it is um, before that premise is released or it's part of this, the the CND or disposal requirement. So, so it's still ongoing. Um, we know that there's a little bit more research to be had with regards to slurry. We do have some um, parameters set right now, though, that we would either require the treatment of it through the use of chemicals or through uh, heat treatment. If it's a slurry, if it's like a solid manure state, then we would look to whether we can combine it with some of the other disposal methods that are being used, such as com uh, composting or uh, burial. Great, thank you. Yeah, that's certainly been a tough one for us to deal with um, throughout Asia as well. Uh, our next question um, is around the zones. So will the size of the zone change depending on the density of farms in a given area? What about movements? How will they be considered in zoning decision? Yeah, so the zone, when, when the PCZ is declared, I mean, it, it is made at the time when you kind of have enough information about the outbreak at that point in time to place your zoning boundaries. But we know that disease can change throughout an outbreak. And so we expect that you could either expand or collapse your zone to meet the outbreak as, as needed. The movements within and through and out of that zone are really restricted um, or defined on what it is that's being moved. So the higher the risk of transmission of disease, the more restrictions that are applied to that. So this also is applied with whether it's from coming from the infected zone or restricted zone. So kind of as our, as our risk of uh, disease transmission reduces, usually the conditions are, are less restrictive. So this part of um, kind of CFI's response is still under development and, uh, and hopefully should be, um, I guess, uh, resolved in the next couple of months so that we can start to share this information a little more broadly with all of our stakeholders. Amy, do you have anything else to comment on this one? Um, yeah, I think um, in terms of movements and zoning decisions, um, I think what the, the asker of the question was alluding to was sort of that network approach in um, evaluating how common patterns of movements may actually impact what a zone might look like more so than just geographical um, proximity. So that's definitely something that we are working with our science branch folks on trying to um, improve and um, increase our modeling capacity where we can look at information that comes out of pig trace, try to understand what movements are common, try to potentially anticipate and model what a disease spread might look like depending on where it might be introduced. Um, so I, I think as we move forward, we'd have to look at um, that information in terms of how we might uh, initially set up zones and, and utilize that as part of our epidemiological evaluation of a situation. Great, thank you for that. Um, changing gears a little bit, a question on small farms or roadside zoos. In small hobby farms or roadside zoos or tourist type operations where pigs are housed in close contact with other species, would those non-swine species be left on the premise? Um, 
perhaps this question is assuming that that farm or zoo was within the primary control zone. Yeah, I guess it's true, Egan, that depends on how that premise is implicated. If it's an infected premise, we only will order the destruction of those swine species on that premise. So uh, no non-susceptible species will be destroyed. We do have some provisions to look at, you know, how did those animals actually interact? Um, what, you know, what might be the level of like contamination on those animals uh, as like a, a vector trend or a fomite transmission rather. So just depending, um, there may be a requirement to have some C and D um, done where those animals are removed from any kind of contaminated areas. Um, we do have some conditions where even like they could go under uh, like a cleaning uh, session themselves like those animals. It just depends on how they're implicated. And then would really require um, the restriction of those animals so that there's no contact with them with other susceptible swine until such time that we deem that they wouldn't be a, a source of fomite transmission. Amy, do you have any other comments on that one? No, I don't think so. You covered that perfectly, Bobby. Great. Um, I'll try. We'll, uh, we'll perhaps go for another four minutes, 10 minutes after the hour. Um, I think we should be able to get most of the questions done. But the next question was around um, veterinarians, non-CFI veterinarians. So since Veterinarians would be important in working with CFIA veterinarians in an investigation. Perhaps they're referring to the herd veterinarian. Would it be possible for that veterinarian to obtain a copy of the premise investigation questionnaire to assist um, the CFIA with the producer at the beginning? Mm. So perhaps a question on the role of the herd veterinarian. Yeah, and it is a good question, particularly if it's the herd veterinarian that's involved with a suspicion, we really uh, look to you for a valuable source of information. And usually it kind of amplifies, if we're hearing it from you, um, that, you know, the likelihood of disease when we're going out there, the suspicion may be higher, right, than if it was a producer uh, reporting it. It would be really beneficial to have like that blank PIQ in advance, and it would help support that uh, producer in collecting their production records. Uh, we, can't we can't provide it after it's completed, of course, because of that Privacy Act restriction, but it would be something that we could look to do um, when we go out to do that first investigation. And if you are the one that's reporting that suspect um, case, we'll ask you a series of questions during that first interview or phone call and, and then ask if you will actually be on premise at the time of the investigation as well. So it is a good best practice to have your engagement for sure. Great, thank you. So um, I think perhaps the, uh, the last one um, was a combination of a statement and some questions. And so I'll try to summarize this, um, Bobby. But I think perhaps the question is how can private practice veterinarians, whether they be swine veterinarians or mixed practitioners or companion animal practitioners, how can they provide um, awareness, education about um, ASF risks to their demographic of clients and perhaps what tools would be available to them? Okay, great. That's a great question. Um, there, of course, through a lot of the preparedness activities, and I think this might be uh, taking some of Amy's uh, content from next week, um, there are actually some really great resources available right now. Um, you can either go through the CFIA website for ASF, provincial or territorial governments also have materials developed as does uh, the Canadian Port Council or uh, provincial or territorial industry association. So, so there are quite a few good resources that are available. And uh, sorry, Amy, I know you will go through this next week. Um, those are the other thing to note is that we do have um, within CFIA, the Office of Animal Biosecurity 
has developed a set of standards, biosecurity standards, that um, can be a really great resource for you to provide to clients or producers that are looking for guidelines for how to increase their biosecurity, especially if they don't already have something in place. Um, it's a great starting point to look to that as well. Um, Amy, is there anything else you'd like to comment on that question? Uh, no, I don't think so, Bobby. You're right that um, next week there will be a lot of resources um, supplied to participants regarding uh, smallholders specifically um, and trying to improve our outreach to that particular population of um, swine producers. And just with respect to biosecurity, and Egan can comment on this as well, that there is a, I think, active review of those standards going on right now um, to update them from their original iteration that I think was done about 10 years ago. So um, lots of emphasis on biosecurity. And as you know, lots of resources available for people to tap into. I think ASF has really raised the awareness of the importance of biosecurity in terms of um, preventing disease and managing disease spread should um, the, a, a particular disease enter Canada. Yeah, lots of resources available for sure. And we should, we should highlight, um, if you go to the Canadian Pork Council's website, you'll see the um, smallholder producer manual that was just put out by BC government and BC Pork. Um, that's a um, very broad, uh, very open, very useful resource. Um, there's also, of course, the 2010 National Biosecurity Standard uh, for everyone to review on the Canadian Pork Council's website. Uh, each and every provincial pork board has great resources on their websites around biosecurity. And of course, the um, CPC is undergoing <clears throat> a review and revision of that uh, 2010 standard and a 2020-2021 will um, be put out fairly soon um, with a lot of updates around new diseases. Of course, we've had PED introduced into North America since 2010. ASF has moved extensively since then. And so lots of great resources for both the smallholders and for um, Bosque security specifically. So with that, I'd like to certainly thank um, Dr. Lundquist and Dr. Snow for their um, presentation, their efforts today. Thank you very much, Bobby. That was fantastic. Thank you to all the participants um, for your questions and engagement today. Uh, lots of great questions. I wish we had a little more time, but uh, it is what it is. Again, I would invite everyone to join us next week, uh, November 3rd, same time for the third seminar in this series and uh, come with questions in hand. Looking forward to seeing you all again. Have a great day, everyone.